Raghavendra Chauhan, a JNU alumni who holds an MBA degree and a PG diploma in journalism, has worked as a section officer in the Armed Forces Headquarters Civil Services. He has an experience of more than 10 years as a faculty, a mentor, a trainer for civil services examinations. Let me welcome Mr. Raghavendra Chauhan for today's session. Hello everyone, I am Raghavendra Chauhan. Faculty of History and Culture. Today, the purpose of making this video is to talk about history and culture section of the preliminary examination. Before going to the main point of discussion, it would be good that I give you an overview of the preliminary examination or the examination of civil services as a whole. As all of you know, there are two parts in the examination. The first part is preliminary examination. Generally, we call it today CSET, Civil Services Aptitude Test, which has got two papers, General, General Studies Paper 1 and General Studies Paper 2. Both of them are more or less objective type. The second part of the examination is the main examination, which has again got two sub parts. One is the main written part and the other one is the interview part. I will not talk about the second part. I will talk about the first part that, that is preliminary examination. Now, I will specifically focus on the history and culture section. It has been found that for many students or civil services aspirants, this area is found to be quite difficult. Reason is very simple. Many of the students do not have a background or they are less interested in this area. And the syllabus is vast. When we jot down all the topics and subtopics, then we get to feel the vastness of the syllabus. Right. And the level of difficulty of questions is also quite good, especially in the combination questions. Therefore, I would like to give certain tips so that your preparation of this section, that is history and culture for preliminary examination or CSET GS paper one becomes quite easy. Uh, the first and foremost thing which I would like to emphasize is that history is full of facts, figures, and I would say dates as well as analysis, it demands a lot of revision and you must have proper place for revision in your timetable with history as a subject, right? I would also like to share my experience that after all, the preliminary examination is a qualifying level examination. I would not expect any of the student or candidate to score 100% in each and every section. Rather, there should be a proper strategy which helps you, uh, helps a candidate in scoring high. You can't get 100% questions right. There is negative marking also and the level of difficulty of certain questions is really very high. Only few students might get all the questions right. Therefore, what should you do? You must optimize your preparation in such a manner that you get maximum possible score in every area same applies to history and culture so what can you do you must adopt an integrated approach to begin with when i say integrated approach for gs history and culture section i mean to say please identify correctly what are the areas which are common in the main examination as well as in the preliminary examination prepare them together and as the preliminary examination comes closer become more pre-oriented and start focusing on the objective information in the history and culture section or in any other section. Second thing I would like to say, be curious like a child. Follow the path or the idea of this, the formula of five W's and one H. When I say five W's and one H, any person, even if he's or she is not a science student, must have that temperament which we call the scientific temper. The tem such a student or candidate will ask questions. Five W's means what, when, where, why and who. And H means how. In these five W's and one H, I think UPSC demands more understanding or better understanding of why and how of any topic. Then history can be made easy to understand and study along with the cultural section by following the approach called PEST analysis. When I say PEST, each uh, alphabet in this PEST stands for something. P means you must analyze the political developments and administrative dimension in, we can say elaborately. 
P stands for political and administrative dimension. E stands for economic dimension. S stands for social, cultural and religious aspects of the syllabus. And then T stands for technology and science. If you cover the political, economic, social and technological dimensions properly, I think everything in every topic of the syllabus in history and culture is covered. Nothing is left. And then <clears throat> I would say the elements of continuity and change must also be identified. When I say continuity and change, I mean to say that there are certain things which occurred in ancient times, continued in medieval times and exist even today. For example, worship of people. We get to see large number of images of people tree on the seals found from Indus Valley civilization. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna calls himself people among all the uh, existing vegetation or flora. Uh, and then people is even revered today. You might find in India, wherever you go, wherever there is a fully grown people tree, there is a sacred thread uh, tied by people around that. It has got a smear, red a smear, and then there might be a uh, god or goddess image kept over there. It is worshipped. To make people understand the importance of people, uh, this was done. It was connected to religion. Why? Because every person is not literate or educated enough or aware enough. They might not understand the environmental importance or contribution made by people. People is one of the plant forms which produces oxygen day in day out and people who are not that aware they will fear to cut down or damage a people tree if it is connected to religion. Sometimes to just make children afraid of people tree they are told uh, there lives uh, uh, the ghosts on the people tree isn't it. So this is how you must identify the elements of continuity and change. Now I would like to uh, say that you must have a proper list of books. There is a lot of confusion among the students what to read and what not to read. So I'll uh, talk about how to begin the preparation and then I will give you some last minute tips. See when it comes to history and culture, uh, there are three sets of books to begin with. One is the old NCRTs, the second is new NCRTs and the third set is the Tamil Nadu books. Uh, for history and culture. So what to do? Uh, I would say if you are just beginning your preparation and you must have a plan of one and a uh, one and a half years to begin with, then you must uh, prepare a plan in which you read all these books. If you are a fresher and if you don't have an, any background in history, if you have a background in history, obviously you can skip certain list of books. So first read the old NCRT books. The first book is Ancient India written by R.S. Sharma. The second book is Medieval India written by Satish Chandra. The third book is Modern India written by Vipan Chandra. And on culture, you can refer an introduction to art, uh, a book uh, for class 11th. And there is a book on crafts also in class 12th. Selective chapters are to be studied from the class 12th crafts book. After reading the old NCRTs, you can go to the new NCRTs. But there is another suggestion. Some students ask me whether they should be studying books from 6th to 12th or just 11th, 12th books or 9th and 10th books. It depends on your background and interest and level of preparation. I would suggest if you are just a fresher and if you have time, read all the old NCRT books from 6th to 12th at least once. Later, you can focus more on 11th, 12th books. The sixth books, uh, because many of the questions can be easily handled in preliminary examination from these books. Then you can go to the new books. Many of the freshers are not comfortable with the new NCRT books, even if they are reading it from 6th to 12th. Reason, these books are not written in a chronological manner. Neither these books are written in a manner where they are covering one topic at a time mentioning all the facts and figures. Rather, they are written in a thematic manner where a particular theme, say, trade and culture, trade and commerce has been picked up and then they treat uh, the entire trade and commerce as one right from industrial civilization up to what you can say post Gupta period. So, the books are more analytical in nature and it is becomes difficult for the beginners to get an easy grasp on these books. So you can skip these books or you can read in the second wave of your reading or second round of your reading. After reading uh, the new NCRT books, you can uh, read the 11th and 12th Tamil Nadu books. 
but depending on your background you can finally choose either old or new NCRT books or Tamil Nadu books any one set of books 11 12th level which you will refer again and again whenever you revise just reading the books will not help first you read the books just like that then you start when you start understanding what is important on the basis of your understanding of previous question papers you get a understanding of the pattern of the examination highlight important facts statements or figures in the books and those facts figures which you have highlighted must come handy when you are preparing notes when it comes to notes making i would suggest you must use a notebook with plain pages no lines because in main examination you have to write on plain paper make margin on both sides write between the margins and only right hand side should be used for preparing your notes leave the left hand side blank why i'm saying this because when you read something new a new fact come to light or some analysis is coming to your mind you can always note it later on the left hand side so you need not to make your notes again and again and you have to make notes only once because uh, civil services preparation is a marathon and you will not get enough time uh, to do these things again and again time management is an important aspect of the entire preparation okay <clears throat> now i would like to come to the list of books as such so as i told you to begin with read the ncrt books or tamil nadu board books once you are done with them uh, i would suggest you read the textbooks if you have time you must read india's struggle for independence by vipin chandra published by penguin you also need to read uh, Sekhar Bandopadhyay's From Plassey to Partition, uh, published by Orient Blackswan. Both of them are very good books. India Since Independence by Vipin Chandra is another recommended book. And then uh, I would suggest if you find these books too voluminous, because modern India is a very important section for main examination as well as preliminary examination. In preliminary examination, it carries around 60% weightage. You can leave these voluminous books just read basic books ncrt's or tamil nadu and then directly come to your class notes which i will provide and you can refer spectrum spectrum is a very compact book covering the entire modern indian history syllabus beautifully it is basically a book which was prepared originally in notes form by one of the uh, person who became ips later mr Raji bahir okay so, so this is the strategy for prelims specifically, uh, you can have another option. If you have, you don't have notes, then you can read the history section of the preliminary gui exam guide published by Tata Magrohill or Arihant. Still, you have confusion. You can reach me through any channel of communication of Vedic IS Academy. I will help you out. I'll help you in making a strategy of your preparation. Now. I come to what you call the index, the list of topics in various sections. Rather than starting from ancient India going chronologically, it is better that I go to different topics importance wise. So the maximum weightage is carried by modern India. But before describing these topics, let us talk about the weightage of history and culture section as such in the preliminary examination. See history and culture section carries, uh, carries a very important weightage almost 17 questions on an average has been asked since the change in preliminary examination was brought in by UPSC in 2011. Till 2019, in the last nine years, 17 questions every year on an average has been asked. The range has been 12 questions to 22 questions. Uh, so history cannot be removed. And in any section you have seen, there is some kind of dynamism and randomness. The examiner might ask more questions from one area in history one year, from another area uh, in another year so you can't uh, take this chance of leaving any area in history or culture section to begin with you have to read all the topics but yes you can be selective as the exam comes closer when you become selective you can give importance to the most important areas which has been underlined in the index or list of topics which i have provided to you through the academy so what are the important areas in modern india modern india the most important areas are Indian national movement which can be divided into three phases moderate phase extremist phase and Gandhian phase within this Indian national movement Gandhian phase is the most important almost every year there has been a question based on Gandhi 
or the Gandhian phase. So you can't ignore that area. That area is equally important in what you call uh, the main examination. Now I would like to jot down the key themes as such. The list of topics which I am mentioning here might vary from what I display on the board, but I am giving you a rough idea. So what are those nine themes? First is establishment of British rule in India means you have to understand how the Britishers started as a trading entity in India and finally they started harboring what you call political ambitions. They got into a conflict with the French, the Anglo-French rivalry which took the shape of three Carnatic wars finally led to the victory of the Britishers and from there they started expanding their, their control over India starting from conquest of Bengal. In conquest of Bengal, for example, you must focus on topics like Battle of Plassey, Battle of Buxar and the Treaty of Allahabad. So establishment of British rule also will include topics where Britishers come in conflict. Uh, the company, English East India Company come in conflict with different powers that were existing in the post Mughal period like uh, except Bengal, uh, uh, besides Bengal there was Hyderabad, uh, there was Mysore, uh, there was what you can say six, uh, there were the Marathas. So Britishers adopted war and non-war techniques. They fought wars with Mysore, Anglo-Mysore wars you must know about, Anglo-Maratha wars you must know about, Anglo-Sikh wars you must know about, but they did not uh, what you can say conquered Nizam or others through war. Rather they used the instruments like what you can say uh, the subsidiary alliance or doctrine of lapse. So these concepts, these terms, uh, these effects you should be knowing very well. Then comes British policy and administration. So how Britishers as they started ruling India developed a system of administration whether it is general administration, revenue administration, judicial administration and what were their policies regarding uh, what you can say uh, different uh, the governance. So when we say British policy and administration uh, we are uh, going to talk about all these things and uh, you must know the key concepts anyhow. Then comes social religious reform movements. It's a very important theme. In this, you should know about all the important movements that started occurring regarding reforms in the social and religious arena. Uh, you have to know the important movements like Brahmo Samaj, like RS Samaj, like Aligarh movement, like Deoband movement. Uh, we can categorize them into the form of four communities which has undergone reforms, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs and uh, Parsis. And you should be from the preliminary point of view knowing about the important organizations or movements, their founders and their contribution in the socio-cultural reform or development. Side by side, you can also focus on lower caste movements uh, like what you can say the Justice Party movement uh, where a demand was made in improving the condition of the lower castes and their increased participation in different aspects of life during the British rule. Then the next theme is a revolt of 1857 which also includes popular uprisings. You must know the causes, consequences, important leaders and what was the significant facts or outcomes related to them. Then comes the rise of nationalism and the formation of International Congress. So how the spirit of nationalism emerged among Indians, what is the contribution of popular uprisings, the revolt of 1857, socio-religious reform movements and uh, the political associations which were formed before the Congress. And finally how it led to the formation of International Congress and an organized international movement emerged and that passed through three phases moderate, extremist and Gandhian phase. Right. You must know all the important contributors in the moderate, extremist as well as the Gandhian phase and the important movements that emerged during these phases. For example, during the extremist movement emerged the partition of Bengal and the Swadeshi movement. During Gandhian phase emerged anti rollet Satyagraha, non-cooperation movement, civil disobedience movement, Quit India movement and at the same time during the entire uh, period also emerged many constitutional developments, many acts and laws were passed. So the basic book should be Pushpesh Pant's book on international relations to lay a good foundation or NCRT books and then you can refer one book on foreign policy either by foreign policy of India either by Rajiv Sikri or by Muchkun Dubey. These are good books and the focus should be on all those aspects of international, international relations that are related to India or that affect India in any manner. And 
you should not lose your focus on what we call the current developments in the arena of international developments some of the magazines which cover it very well are like um, world focus mainstream uh, the international issues and relations are very well covered in these magazines if you find time you can read selective topics from there as suggested by your mentors or faculties besides that the websites of ministry of external affairs press information bureau or the news items from all india radio or the topics discussed uh, on the channels like rajya sabha tv and lok sabha tv can be very helpful now we come to the next paper that is a gs paper 3 it covers the areas like economy and development agriculture science and technology environment and biodiversity disaster management and internal security see economic development is also an important theme in the preliminary examination so you can have an integral approach for this section economy and development in gs paper 3 mains as well as gs paper 1 prelims you must identify the key areas you will be provided the list of topics what we call index based on the analysis of previous year's question papers some of the key areas in economics which are covered by the ncert books as well as the other textbooks uh, are liberalization privatization and globalization that is economic reforms lpg which came in uh, 1990s when manmohan singh was the finance minister and pv narasimha rao was the prime minister of india then the other important areas are poverty human capital formation rural development employment growth and informalization infrastructure development environment and sustainable development land resources such themes are very well covered in ncert books that's why we say don't leave read thoroughly the ncert books <clears throat> there are many textbooks suggested for the economy section once you have read two or three basic ncert books we suggest read any one book for the freshers i would suggest sanjeev verma is a very good book for the people who have a background in economy they can read a book like ramesh singh it is specifically written for civil services examination right <clears throat> then report of the latest finance commission is also very important it is available on the site called www.fincomindia.nic.in right so you see the government sites are really very important they can be very helpful but you will need some help of experts to identify what to study from there because you can't read the entire report that will be very well key that way your preparation will become endless now <clears throat> i would like to talk about what we call uh, the disaster management section uh, see if we look at uh, science and technology or disaster management again the relevant ministries report is important ndma national disaster management authority its website is very helpful in providing information about different types of disasters and how they are to be managed right <clears throat> in every section ncert books either in their entirety or relevant chapters are very important then list will be provided to you right <clears throat> in science and technology whether it is for prelims or mains as i told you earlier also it is very important that you do not just pay attention to theory part you must pay attention to the application of that knowledge in day to day life and what are the current developments in different areas like biotechnology like robotics like nanotechnology uh, or what you call intellectual property rights information technology space defense computers all these things keep a uh, eye on these developments through newspapers and magazines you will be given uh, or the necessary information will be shared and analyzed with you by the academy as well by your respective faculties right <clears throat> now i would like to uh, talk about environment and biodiversity which is again a very important area common to preliminary exam as well as main examination the relevant ncert books on science and biology as well as a chapter in economic survey by the heading 
sustainable development in climate change is very helpful. The annual report of the Ministry of Environment and Forest, its summary will be also helpful in doing justice to this area and the environment report of the Ministry of Environment and Forest is also helpful. The Hindu also service, uh, the Hindu publication also uh, publish a book uh, or a booklet by the heading environmental survey, survey every year. Yojana, that magazine which is suggested to you is an important magazine. It also covers such themes which are related to environment, ecology, economy, education, different sectors. So Yojana is a very thin magazine. It is a monthly magazine. It is a must for the examination. Every year, some questions are directly picked up from that magazine. <clears throat> Climate change is a very pet theme. You should not leave uh, it untouched. IPCC website could also be very helpful. Terry website could be also very helpful. Now, <clears throat> I would like to talk about the last part of the syllabus that is internal security there are five topics in, in in internal security displayed on my back on the screen see either you can read one book or the notes and guidance provided by the classroom uh, by the institute will be enough for value addition you can refer the certain reports of second administrative reforms commission uh, like capacity building for conflict resolution or combating terrorism uh, or report of Panchi Commission on Central State Relations which talks about nationalism, uh, the problems in Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir uh, and it also gives conclusions and recommendations about these problems. EDSA, Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis publishes different articles and on its website they can also be very helpful. I would not like to make a profession very bulky therefore you can restrict your preparation to limited resources uh, it is better to study a particular resource which is the best time and again rather than referring many resources time and again because that spread your syllabus over a vast period of time and uh, compromises your concentration or focus so attention should be paid to a book or a source as per its ability to fulfill the requirement of the exam uh, I would suggest one book published by Macro Hill, which covers the syllabus in, in, in its entirety by the heading Internal uh, Security and Disaster Management, written by an IAPS officer called Ashok Kumar. That should be sufficient for you. Right? You should update that knowledge with current developments from the news. Uh, it you can cover it from different newspapers and mag magazines. For example, a particular terrorist organization is in news. The terms like undercover or uh, the terms like what you can say TADA or UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, uh, these should be known to you. These acts have been amended recently, they were in news recently, so you must be aware of them. Now I come to the last paper of general studies mains that is ethics integrity and aptitude this paper is one paper where you can do wonders by applying common sense by developing a practical approach and studying less provided you develop your personality and thought process in such a manner where you can identify that in a given situation which uh, brings your ethical notions in play and creates ethical dilemma what is the practical solution to that problem? How will you exercise your discretion as an officer? And what is the best course of action which you can take? What is the best course of action? A best course of action in solving a problem which creates ethical dilemma is that you take in care while performing that action or taking the decision, maximum public good or welfare. You do not compromise any important law or uh, the basic what you can say structure of the constitution and you do not do something which which haunts your conscience and you are sure that whatever you do did was the best possible thing you could do in a given situation you if you can justify your decision or action in a given situation uh, then i think you have done 
the best you could do in a given situation. The entire syllabus is divided into seven topics. The topics are drawn from areas like philosophy, psychology, history and sociology. 50% is weightage is given to what you can say the theoretical section where questions are asked related to concepts and terms like uh, what you can say accountability, responsibility uh, or you can say governance, ethical governance. On the other hand questions are also asked on the basis of what you can say quotes. A quote is presented to you said by a very important person and you have to analyze it in the ethical context. Then questions are also asked where your opinion is demanded depending on a current issue which was uh, there uh, under discussion which might have created controversy or there was conflict of opinion uh, among different sections of the society. Good understanding of sections like polity and history in GS will come handy in doing justice to different aspects of theoretical as well as case studies uh, questions in uh, what you can say the GS paper um, 4 related to ethics. 50% questions are asked from the case study section. I mean to say that out of total 250 marks which are devoted to GS paper 4 ethics, integrity and aptitude, 50% questions are based on theory and another 50% questions are based on case studies. And if you are wise enough, intelligent enough to understand the problems from practical point of view and application of the theory in ethics, I think you can do wonders and this paper could be a game changer in improving your score overall in general studies. And sometimes it could be decisive in deciding your selection in the main examination and get a call for interview. Why I am saying this? People have scored marks in double digits, digits as well as in triple digits depending on what their approach was towards uh, the entire paper especially case studies. Now to lay a sound foundation you must do well in certain sections of GS as I told you polity, history etc. At the same time to get a grip on basic concepts of ethics, you can read certain books like Ethics in Public Administration by P.J. Sheeran, which is published by Vikas Publication House. Then you can also read a book like Ethics by William Frankina. If you want to read a book only from exam point of view, I would suggest Subba Rao and Chaudhary, both IS officers, have written a book on ethics, integrity and aptitude with analysis of previous question papers as well as enough case, study, case studies and elaborate discussion on different terminologies of ethics. There is another uh, book uh, which I could suggest uh, published by Chronicle Publication which is called Lexicon which is popular in the market by the name Lexicon of Ethics. So these are certain books. But more than books, it is your overall understanding of different topics and your preparation in other sections of GJS that will decide how well you do in ethics paper. So this paper directly does not have to do much with what you can say the prelim section, but the knowledge which you acquire during the preparation of GS in prelims and mains definitely helps in handling certain questions in theory and case studies. Uh, now, before winding up, I would like to say that or I would like to share it with you that in prelims there are two general studies paper, the, both the papers carry 200 marks each. The first paper is counted in deciding whether you qualify prelims or not. The second paper is of qualifying nature which you call wrongly CSET paper, it is GS paper 2 and in this paper uh, you have to score 33 percent marks that is out of 200 if you score 66 uh, you have qualified that paper. Only if you qualified GS paper 2 in preliminary exam or CSET exam the, your first paper will be violated. If you don't qualify the second paper first paper will not be violated. It means even if you have done very well in GS paper 1 in preliminary examination your effort has gone waste because you did not qualify the second paper. When it comes to main examination, you should know that in total there are nine papers out of which four are GS papers, but any paper will be 
evaluated only if you qualify the two papers of language that is one language you have to choose from the eighth schedule of the constitution which carries 22 languages like hindi punjabi uh, mathili such languages or the second paper is the english language paper both are 10th level paper and you have to score only 25 percent marks out of 300 marks each it means you have to score only 70 uh, i would say 75 marks if you take it very lightly you do not prepare it at all you ignore it you fail to qualify what will happen none of your other papers will be evaluated which are counted in merit so your effort will go waste if you ignore this paper so pay attention to those papers the last tips from my side regarding general studies whether it is prelims or mains is that you must plan your time in advance a year and a half ahead that how you are going to cover the entire syllabus whether you are going to go undergo self study or you are going to join an institute what are the books you are going to read all these things must be properly defined before you start your preparation after preparing a full plan make sure that you execute that plan but the plan should be flexible enough so that if at a time of emergency you are not able to devote time to your preparation you do not feel broken or shattered right <clears throat> then make sure that you practice enough that you are able to finish your exam whether it at the preliminary exam uh, pre preliminary level or main level uh, in a time bound manner there is a time limit to both the exams preliminary level each paper is of two hours uh, each and at the main examination level each paper is of three hours time limit so keep this in mind also in main examination whether it is gs or other sections stick to the word limit it is always better to write a compact answer in the word limit or less than the word limit rather than writing a longer answer why because the number of questions asked is huge and you will not be able to cover all the questions if you start long uh, writing long answers for every question that's why practice is required practice in advance and learn to introduce properly your answers and conclude properly and when you start writing an answer even if you are practicing it i sincerely advise that you must prepare a framework for every answer means how you will introduce what are the main points and what is their sequence which you are which you are going to write in an answer and how you are going to conclude if it is a question which is talking about a particular problem or issue you must be original enough in suggesting certain solutions to that problem not just on the basis of bookish knowledge but what you think about the problem and how you are going to solve it a line or two about a uh, solution will be very helpful as far as the examination real examination situation is concerned i would suggest read each and every question properly many students due to pressure sometimes read and understand questions wrongly and they regret later so better it is you go slow you read the question identify the keywords whether it is preliminary examination or main examination and then as per the demand of the question answer correctly the objective or subjective question in main written examination it is suggested that never lose your focus from the question which you are attempting why because if you lose focus you your thoughts will wander and you will end up, end up writing an answer which you did not want and that will compromise your score in that answer and it will have an impact on your overall score so each and every question matters each and every uh, mark in the exam matters cumulative score is very important so be patient be focused be uh, cool while attempting questions <clears throat> that's why we suggest that uh, you must develop a point based skill of answer writing uh, or point based uh, preparation of notes so that all the important aspects of a particular topic are covered easily by you and you do not miss out on important points and finally it is very important it is civil services examination an examination where you are aspiring for elite civil services you are supposed to cultivate the ability to think clearly 
execute hope and positivity. So never show a negative side or temperament in your answers. Always be positive and try to show a positive picture even if the picture presented by in the question or the topic is very negative. Right. <clears throat> and never get stuck. If you are stuck in prelims or main examination on a particular question, better it is you don't get stuck, rather you move forward, come back to that question later so that you manage your time properly and attempt all the questions within the prescribed time limit and do not regret later. So my last advice to all of you is that you prepare a plan in which you cultivate a habit of reading the newspapers daily, covering one or two sections of GS on daily basis, the theoretical portion, the conventional portion, as well as the current issues. At the same time, you also prepare your optional. Nothing is compromised. Don't take too much of burden. Prepare in such a manner which is practically possible for you. Every individual is different from any other individual. And now the last most tips from my side keep your workplace the place of study very well organized that organization will be reflected in your thoughts your ideas your expression in the answer in your personality in the interview and your study table must be like a temple for you where you keep only those things which you are going to study on a given day you must have a drawer in where you keep your previous question papers your syllabus and newspaper only that material which you are going to study at a given point of time should be on your study table and none of your books should be visible in front left or right rather they on they should be on the back side well organized topic wise in your racks so that psychological pressure is not created on you when you see your books again and again and take sound sleep don't study at a stretch in long hours why because human mind generally has the capacity to absorb information on a consistent basis only for two and uh, two three hours at a given point of time so take breaks i don't mean that on a particular day when you are studying you study for two hours and then take a break of four hours don't do that take a break of say half an hour then continue on an average when exam is not nearby uh Quality study of seven to eight hours daily is sufficient. When the exam is very close, your number of hours might increase. So get out of this myth that every candidate who is preparing for the exam studies for 17 to 18, 17 to 18 hours daily. That's not right. But yes, consistency in your preparation and approach will definitely get you through. I wish all of you very best of luck. With this, I wind up. Thank you.